Six Dots, a story of young Louis Braille. Pronunciation Guide for French Words, Names, and Phrases Used in the Text Louis Braille, Papa, Maman, Couvrez, Ne Touche Pas, Marquise, Bienvenue, Paris, Gabriel, Asseyez-vous ici, Voilà, C'est tout. Lève-toi, allons, pigné, oui, fini, tu l'as fait, c'est facile, et si vite. On the day I was born, Papa announced me to the village. Here is my son, Louis. The neighbors came clucking their tongues, whispering, too small, he won't survive. Oh, but I did survive. I was a curious child and my eyes studied everything. Mama's gentle face, lace draping my cradle, the smooth shape of a bread loaf on the table. I grew strong and healthy. When I rode to the bakers on my brother's broad shoulders or fed the chickens with my sisters, the villagers waved and smiled. So handsome, they cried. And clever, too, my sisters said. At three, I knew everyone in Koufre by name. I counted the eggs in my sister's basket and the sparrows in the trees. I repeated stories I heard word for word. But what I loved most was to watch Papa work. Papa came from, people came from far away to have a harness made or a broken bridle mended. In Papa's hands, the rough leather strips became smooth and useful. I wanted to be just like him, but when I reached for a tool, Nitush Pa, don't touch that, Papa warned. Then more gently, you're too small yet, Louis. Wait till you're older. Too small? Those words, I wanted to be bigger, stronger, older. Perhaps if I showed Papa what I could do. The leather was smooth, the awl was sharp. I knew just how to. Papa, Papa, Papa! My life changed that day. A healer bandaged my eye. Again, I heard, Nitush Pa, don't touch. But the bandage itched so much. My hands, like the sparrows in the trees, were small and quick. I couldn't keep them away. I didn't mean to make things worse, but I did. The infection spread to my other eye until I could see nothing at all. No trees or sparrows, no faces no lace or loaves of bread. By the time I turned five, I was completely blind. The villagers whispered, poor Louis Braille, such a clever boy. What will happen to him now? My world was dark and dangerous. I stumbled about the house, banging into the chairs, the walls, the door. My body ached. Where is the sun? I cried. But the sun did not come. I sat by the window, training my ears to do what my eyes could not. Clang, bang, ksh, ksh. That was Papa in his shop. Swish, swish, swoosh, swish. Long skirted ladies hurrying to market. Clomp, 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 stomp. Soldiers marching down the street. Grr, the neighbor's angry dog, chained too tight, alone in the dark. I knew just how he felt. My family did what they could. Papa made a wooden cane. Each day I walked a little farther, tap, 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 
tap, tap. Counting the steps between the house and the garden, the vineyard and the chicken coop, the bakers and the millers, and back to Papa's shop. My brother taught me to whistle. And when the sound echoed back, it warned me of things in my path. My sisters made a straw alphabet. Papa made letters with leather strips or by pounding round topped nails into boards. With my ma, I played dominoes, counting the dots with my fingertips. The village priest taught me to recognize trees by their touch, flowers by their scent, and birds by their song. I listened closely as he read to me from the Bible and from books of poetry. Do you have books for blind children? I asked. No, Louis, the priest replied. I'm sorry. When I was older, I went to school with the other village children. All day, as they wrote down words and numbers or read out loud from printed pages, I sat in the front row, listening and memorizing. Do you have books for blind children? I asked again. No, Louis, the teacher replied. I'm sorry. But I didn't want people to feel sorry for me. I just wanted to read and to write on my own like everyone else. The Marquise, a noble lady living nearby, heard about me. She wrote a letter to the Royal School for the Blind, asking if I could study there. Finally, a reply came. Bienvenue. Welcome, Louis. The priest says they have books for the blind, I told Papa excitedly. But you're only 10, Mama cried. And you'll live there most of the year, my brother added. Paris is a big city far away, my sisters warn. How can I make them understand? Without books, I would always be poor Louis Braille. I would always be held back like that dog chained too tight. I love you, I told them, but I must go. I didn't need my eyes to know that the royal school in Paris was not a palace. My hard bed was in a damp, crowded room. My uniform itched. My meals were small and cold. The teachers were strict. The older boys teased and stole. How I missed my home. And yet, I stayed. I stayed because somewhere in this old, moldy building, there were books for the blind. Only the best students are allowed to read them, my friend Gabrielle told me. Then I will be one of the best, I replied. Learning at the blind school was almost like learning in Couvre. We sat and listened. We memorized and recited. We also had music lessons and made slippers in the workshop. As my fingers flew across the organ keys or between the strips of cloth, I dreamed of reading and writing. I worked and studied as hard as I could. Finally. It was that day. A guide led me to the library. Asseyez-vous, ici. Sit here, he commanded. There was shuffling, grunting, and scraping. A thud. Voila. There it is, he said. Just trace the raised letters with your fingers. It was a long reach to the top of the page. My fingers traced the outline of each letter just as I'd done in Couvre with straw and leather. But these waxy letters were huge. After reading the first sentence this way, my hand was halfway down the page. A few sentences more and I had to turn the page. A few more sentences, two more pages, and then the end. Say two? Is that all? I asked. There are more, the guide replied, but they're just like this one. Words as large as my hand. Sentences that took up half a page. I sighed. Even if I read a hundred books like this, how much could I learn? I skipped supper. I lay in my bed wishing I was home. When I finally fell asleep, I dreamed that the neighbor's angry dog broke free.
He ran to me, licking my face until I laughed and laughed. Louis, Louis, left toi Get up. Gabrielle shook me awake. It was morning. The headmaster wants us. Let's go. Allons. Everyone had gathered in the big room. Dr. Pignet spoke. A French army captain has invented a code to send secret messages during battle. The code is read by touch, not by sight. So we might use it here too. You're each holding a message written with patterns of dots, the headmaster continued. Each pattern stands for a sound, such as oo or in or ch. We listened as he explained. It wasn't easy. There was a lot to remember. Flipping my paper over, I moved my fingers from left to right, feeling the dots. Fall back, I shouted. Everyone laughed. It was a battle order, of course, but now my heart pounded with hope. I asked for another. Again, I touched the dots. Supplies arrive at dawn. We, oui. yes, the headmaster cried. The others shouted their messages too. How are the messages written? I asked. The headmaster handed me a slate, a wooden frame with a metal piece in the middle. Slide your paper underneath, he explained. Now take this stylus, but be careful. The sharp tool was like the awl in Papa's shop. I shivered. Use it to punch the code into the paper, he said. I made a few of the complicated dot patterns, then flipped the paper to read them by touch. For many weeks I practiced, reading by touch using dots was a brilliant idea at least on the battlefield. But for us, the code was so hard that everyone else in the school had given up. Even a short message takes so many dots and I can't fit a single symbol under my finger, I complained to Gabrielle. Plus, the captain's code stands for sounds, not for letters. So what, my friend replied. So, why shouldn't we spell words and write sentences like sighted people do, I argued. This code was a start, but it wasn't nearly good enough. We, the blind, were still held back. Would the captain work on improving it with me? I asked the headmaster. I'm sorry, Louis. He isn't interested, he replied. Sorry. That word. Long ago, I had watched Papa take rough leather strips and make them useful. Now I knew what I had to do. Late at night, while the others slept, I bent over my slate and punched the pages. I tried hundreds of ways to simplify the captain's code. I worked until my back was stiff and my fingers ached. Often, I fell asleep a few minutes before morning. A year passed, then another, and another. That winter, I turned 15. I was often sick, but I wouldn't rest. Finally, it was ready to test. I asked the headmaster to choose something from his own library, a book I'd never heard of before. Please, read it out loud, I said. Dr. Pignet began. After a few minutes, I interrupted. You can go much faster, sir. As he read, I copied down the words, spelling each one correctly. My new code used just six dots, arranged in two columns like dominoes. Each dot pattern stood for a letter of the alphabet. Fini, said Dr. Pignet when he reached the end of chapter one. Finished. I turned my pages over. Reading by touch, I recited the entire chapter. Louis, tu l'as fait! You did it! He shouted. Word spread quickly. The other students rushed to try it. Si facile! So easy! A si vite! And so fast! We can read words and write letters like everyone else. As my friends traded messages, I remembered Papa. I remembered watching Papa in his shop. 
bent over rough strips of leather, making them useful. I had become like him, after all. Author's Note If I asked you to make a list of great inventors, who would be on that list? Gutenberg? Da Vinci? Edison? Then there are Bell, Franklin, Marconi, Tesla, Carver, Whitney, Hopper. Just a sampling of more names you might consider based on the number, kind, and overall impact of their creations. But do you know that nearly every day, whenever you're in a school, restaurant, hotel, elevator, bank, or other public space, the invention of a teenager is there too? The name Braille deserves to be on everyone's list of great inventors. Just like these others, he recognized a rough idea, a fingertip code used on battlefields, and worked exhaustively to shape it into something that changed the world forever. Unlike those other inventors, however, Braille was a child inventor who worked alone and without public support or financial backing. Living in a converted prison building and already suffering the early signs of lung disease, Louis Braille managed to create a system of reading and writing for the blind that is still used today. In the past several centuries, no one so young has developed something that has had such a lasting and profound impact on so many people. This is my second book about Louis Braille. In 1994, my young adult biography of Braille was published as part of the series, Great Achievers, Lives of the Physically Challenged. The book was designed to inform and it did so well enough, I think. But more recently, as I encountered examples of the Braille alphabet in public libraries and on college campuses, in airports, and on ATMs, I asked myself, what did it feel like to be Louis Braille? Nothing I'd read about the young Frenchman, including my own account, had led me to experience Braille's emotions. What was it like to be Louis Braille? This story is my attempt to answer these questions. <laughs>